That was terrifying, walking in and seeing all these shiny sharks and, and just staring at them for a couple of minutes going, oh my God, is the music ever going to stop? That's a long time to it, be standing there. Yeah, so as I was watching the, the series air, every time I heard that music, it just gave me the worst anxiety. G'day guys, welcome back to the Coast and Commerce podcast. I'm Ben Amos from Innovate Media and this show is all about bringing stories, insight and inspiration from Sunshine Coast business leaders to you guys, the listeners and viewers of this show to hopefully inspire your business journey as well. And one of those inspiring business leaders of the Sunshine Coast that I've got here on today's episode is Susan Toft from The Laundry Lady, or can we say as seen on Shark Tank? Is that fair? <laughs> yes, that tagline is going to follow us all around. So you may have seen some of the great stuff Susan's been doing uh, on the uh, TV show Shark Tank recently. But before we get into that, uh, Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. So you weren't always the laundry lady. So, you know, take us back. Like what, what kind of was your business story getting to the point of starting Laundry Lady? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I had a, a big, long career in my 20s and early 30s working for uh, in marketing and communications roles. I was based in Sydney and I worked in government and membership organisations and um, I was with the Australian Trade Commission for eight years. And uh, when that came to an end, I was also a new mum and I was really struggling with work-life balance and you know I think when when mums in particular have a big career and then they become a mum they you know really struggle with how am I going to do this and be the mum that I want to be and so I was really at a I think crossroads of that um, and that's when I thought I want to do something really different I've got this big career in marketing but I want to throw that all in and do something completely different what about laundry? <laughs> uh, and that, that's like the, the start of your entrepreneurial journey, I guess, right? Because you hadn't done any of your own business prior to that. Well, I my dad had a bowling centre when okay. I grew up and my very first business was when I was seven. I was face painting and <laughs> I set up a little stand in the back of the bowling centre and I was charging people $2 to paint their faces. So that was my first entrepreneurial. Oh, great. <laughs> no, but yeah, no, this was my first business and I knew – for a long time that I really wanted to create one. I guess growing up in that environment with with my dad, you know, you know, having the Tempe Bowling Centres as, as a child, I really wanted to – I just always knew I wanted to have my own business. I just didn't know what it was going to be. Um, and when I left Austrade and was going through that, you know, and I thought, oh, I could start something in marketing. That's my background. But, you know, it's really hard. You've got to have clients. You've got to – you know, put yourself out there and do all those things. And I didn't feel at that time that I was, you know, ready to do something like that was marketing related. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to have something where I could have flexibility and work from home and um, be there for my kids and pick them up from school and do all of those things. And so I just racked my brains about what can I do that I can be doing from home and saw the clothes piled high on my bed in my bedroom and in my spare room, as I'm sure everyone can relate to, and thought, oh, what about a laundry service? This would be great. I could catch up on a lot of Netflix. I could start this business um, and work from home and, you know, have that flexibility. But I also kind of had this vision, I guess, that I would scale it. And I think that's because I had worked in a lot of franchise type system businesses um, where there had been scaling. And so I'd always sort of had this vision that, you know, that's what, what the business might look like eventually, but it took a long time to get to that point. <laughs> I, lo I love that. That's, it's a very common entrepreneurial journey, I think, of scratching your own itch to start with, you know, like coming up with an idea that's like something I need. So couldn't I do this for others? Right. And you know, I, but I think that the interesting angle that you you take into it there is what you just mentioned of the idea. It wasn't just you, you're just going to start up a, a laundry service where you just do washing and ironing for people. It was, it was much more than that. You had a bigger vision. So, can I make an assumption that that vision was was clear right from the start, or would would that be not? Yeah, clear? I think it was clear in that I was definitely going to scale it, and but the the format of that probably changed over time. You know, in the beginning, I thought it would be a franchise model, um, and 
you know, I'd have maybe 20 people out there who'd be doing this franchise model. Um, but then when I started, when I got to the stages where I started getting advice around that, it was very expensive, very complicated to do franchising in Australia. And so um, Uber was just really starting in Australia and I started looking at their model. I was also, you know, as because I was a mum and I was a Thermomix consultant at the time and looking at the model of Thermomix and, um, and, and, you know, and other businesses like that and thinking, well, they're all focused on an independent contractor model. Why can't I go down that path, which would be cheaper and I could set that up and I could see how that would work um, and much more simpler for the people joining. So, but those things didn't come till later, but it was definitely from the beginning, you know, the vision that it would be a scalable business. I, I knew that I wasn't going to do the laundry forever. It's not, yeah. it's, that's not my passion doing laundry. Um, and, you know, and, and most of the people who join us, our contractors, they don't come because they love the laundry. They come because they love, they want the flexibility of, of what that type of business can provide them. You know, if they're working from home and they can be there for their kids or look after their elderly parents or, um, or whatever it is that they need work-life balance around, you know, that's what the business provides. And so that's where I guess my passion and the vision really, you know, has stuck to is that our business is very much about creating time and flexibility, um, both for our contractors who join us as well as for our customers who we save time doing doing their laundry for them. Yeah, awesome. So can you tell us about the business model now that you've landed on for the laundry lady? So for people that haven't come across the brand or the business before, what, is it, what does it look like? What do you offer? Yeah, so we have a team of independent contractors, our laundry ladies and lads who are Australia-wide. So they all work from their own home and they'll go out and pick up the laundry, take it home, wash or iron it, and then take it back to the customer the next day. Um, they We pay them a commission and they're earning anywhere between $300 to $3,000 per week, depending on how much they want to work. Mm. Uh, so for some of them, it might be just, you know, an extra couple of hundred dollars that they want to get, you know, just, just in a little bit of spare time. And for others, it's their full-time business. Um, and we really love to be able to support them wherever they are in that journey. And sometimes that journey changes while they're with us as well. Um, so we, our customers are a broad range of customers. So not just residential people who hate laundry, but also lots of business customers, um, beauty salons, Airbnbs, medical clinics, lots of different places, lots of different small business who just, you know, might have tea towels and towels that need to be picked up regularly. Um, we have, you know, the Apple stores in Sydney, like there's all different types of businesses that, that we're servicing uh, all of the time. So I don't think at the beginning, I really had that vision that there was mm. going to be all of, you know, such a variation in the type of customers. Um, but it really has, has you know, grown and, and, and all the time we start getting new niche um, industries coming to right. us for, for their laundry. So um, it's, I mean, everyone has laundry, right? Like it's never ending. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But you've intrigued me. Apple stores, like what laundry are they doing? Well, I think they just have microfiber cloths right. and okay. things like that. And, all, yes. All screen cleaning. Yep. And I mean, some places have, just have their staff uniforms. We have lots of sporting okay. groups. Um, there's, yeah, there's so much variation, which is amazing. There you go. Lots of laundry to be done and you, you're there to, well, not you, but not you're me. independent <laughs> contractors. Yeah. So tell me about that business model. So you just, you moved away from the franchise kind of idea into this independent contractor model, which is I guess more aligned to that Uber kind of a model, right? But it, would you call it that kind of gig-based thing or is it, it's different to that? Yeah, look, I mean, we get classified in the gig-based right. um, type of role because that's what, what Uber is. But I, I would say for us it's a little bit different because there's a lot of consistency in our work. So most of our customers, 90 95% in fact, are recurring. Um, so they'll use our services more than once or they'll have yeah. a regular weekly fortnightly pickup. So for our for our contractors, that means very regular work. They know, you know, they, they get to know their customers um, and which is really lovely as well because they get to have a conversation with them when they pick up or deliver it back to them. Um, and so, um, you know, that recurring business means it's, it's ongoing business for them. So it's a little bit different, I guess, to, to gig economy where you just work whenever you feel like it and, and, and earn some money. It's, it is a lot more regular and consistent work, but 
but again, very flexible around, you know, what works for you. You can yeah. do that on a Saturday if you want, or you can do it Monday to Friday, you know, that there's lots of flexibility. Um, and, and also the benefits of that model compared to a franchise model is that it, it's very, very cheap to join. So for our contractors, we just charge a $399 starter kit, which they get supplies as part of that. Um, but that, you know, we were really passionate about being able to provide something um, for our contractors so that they could just get on and get started and start building fast. Um, not everyone has the money that it, it requires. Uh, there's some similar franchises out there that it costs $60,000 to set up, you mm. know. And I know yeah. when I was a new mum or, or a single mum and I needed to, you know, get income fast, there's no way I could have afforded that kind of, you know, setup fee. So we wanted to really have it as, as something that was a low startup cost to be able to get people, you know, up and running with their own business. Um, so yeah, we're really proud of being able to you know offer that to to our contractors, yeah. um, and and we've grown to more than two hundred um, laundry ladies and lads Australia wide. So it's it's grown really fast. Yeah, that's so cool. So I, I'm interested though, and I know from talking to you prior to this recording here that it wasn't just like had an idea to the moon, right? It was, um, there was a, there was a success (laughs) that took 10 years in the making. (laughs) Take us back to those, like those, those early kind of speed bumps you had to overcome because I know it wasn't a smooth sailing journey and, you know, I know you've got much of the journey ahead of you as well, but you know, what was, what were those early challenges that you needed to overcome? Yeah, there's been a lot of challenges. Look, I think in the very early stages, it was, you know, I had all these ideas about moving it into this scalable model, but I had no money, no time, and and I was I was stuck working in the business. And I know that lots of people get frustrated with that, but you know, I, it was just me. I was the original laundry lady, and I was picking up every all the jobs in my area. And as I was ironing, I'd be thinking, how am I ever going to get to that next stage to be able to scale when I have zero dollars to my name? You know, I had a whole bunch of personal debts at that point in time, and and I knew that I wanted this big digital booking system to be able to grow that but I'm like well I know they cost lots of money and how am I ever going to get to that stage and so that was probably the biggest challenge in the beginning was just you know finding finding how we were going to do that Mm. Um, and I started in 2012 in 2016 um, I went to Queensland government and got a digital grant I was one of those first digital grant rounds, um, which was a very undersubscribed program back then. So I got $5,000 and went to um, a developer friend and said, I want this Uber style website. And he laughed at me and said, that's going to cost you a lot more than five grand. (laughs) And so he said, you know, you need to go and find some off the shelf systems. I didn't even know what that meant at the time, but you know, you've got to find something that's sort of off the shelf and we can just integrate it and and that will, that will get you started. And so I researched and researched and researched till I found a booking system that could I thought could do you know majority of the job that we needed um, and we're actually still using that booking system today okay. but we have definitely outgrown it and we're about to launch our very own custom system but again that's taken you know a really long time to get to so um, so that point at 2016 when I got that um, off the shelf system and integrated into our website that was really when it changed the business changed into that that new model to be able to scale and have contractors and things like that um, but then I guess my biggest challenge was personal I, I got divorced and I had to rebuild my life and um, financially and emotionally and everything else and I moved to the Sunshine Coast and um, and restarted my life and and I had to go back to work full time because of just personal debts and and you know part of that rebuilding and so the business really came became a side hustle for a few years so again that was kind of the next you know sort of challenge it was those years of oh, how am I ever going to get back to this business full-time like mm. I've got all these ideas I've started it I've got you know all of these things in motion but no time to be able to do that and and work um, and so that went on for a few years and then COVID kind of was the the, the next st- you know step that kind of pushed me out of that and 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 then there was a lot of government grants around and so um, I tried to access as much of that as I could and that was the point where it was well it's now or never I can come back to the business full time finally and give it a go and 
Um, and then, you know, that was three years ago. And so committing in those three years, like the business has completely changed in those three years. Um, that's really was the restart button, I guess, on the business. And now it's all different sorts of challenges, you know, but it's still, you. I, I think you, no matter what stage you are in in business, you have challenges and you just have to get through that to get to the next stage, which is always the hardest bit. <laughs> yeah. That, that COVID catalyst, I think, has been a, a thing for a lot of businesses, you know, for, for good or for bad. But, you know, yeah. it's definitely, it kicked a lot of businesses in the pants, so to speak. Um, and either it caused pivots or, or people launched things or people closed things and started new things. Yeah. And there's a lot that happened in that time. But, um, you know, do you see that as a as a blessing now, for, you know, that that, that forced your hand somewhat? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was, you know, working full time before that and just didn't know how I could, you know, I'm, I'm a single mum and I needed income and I just didn't know how I could possibly leave a full time income and come to a business that wasn't going to supply that full-time income you know it like that transition and I know that's really tough for a lot of people you know transitioning from that side hustle into their full-time gig because you you, we we still need to have money to live um and so that was that was really really you know the hardest thing for me and having that push it was it I, I was very excited mm. <laughs> because it was, you know, I just always said I need six months to just focus on this business and I can get it really, you know, starting to kick goals. But, you know, I just needed income to be able to do that. And, and definitely COVID really helped me, you know, being able to do that and have the time and, and yeah. And so, and, and, and it's so exciting now because we're, now we're just finally getting to the stage of all the things that I was thinking about. 10 years ago when I was ironing that I wanted to do and, um, you know, just actually starting to do some of those things, which is really exciting. Very exciting. And, you know, a couple of years of, of getting that kick up the pants and then starting to get that momentum and you expanded, you, you got some of those independent contractors in, you expanded some territory and then you ended up on Shark Tank, <laughs> <laughs> Shark Tank Australia. So take us there. Like, how did that come about? Um, so I get these crazy ideas and think, let's just do it. <laughs> um, so Shark Tank uh, had not been aired for a few years, I think mm. since before COVID. Um, and they suddenly announced in April, um, that they were going to be relaunching Shark Tank Australia. And I'd always thought, oh, that could be, you know, something really fun to do. And they were asking for auditions. And I said to Jane, who ma manages our marketing should we do it? And she always gets a bit scared when I come up with these ideas. And I think a day later we were filming this crazy audition tape with me swimming like a shark and doing all kinds of crazy things. Anyway, um, hopefully she never shows that video, but oh, I see <laughs> she's it. got it. She's still got it. Um, so yeah, we put the audition tape in, not really thinking it through all that much. Um, I was quite excited by the new sharks as well, because, you know, we'd, we'd had the same set of sharks in Australia for a long time. And I think I think the new sharks are, you know, young and a different different um, demographic in terms of their businesses. And so, you know, I was I was really excited by Jane Liu, who runs Showpo. I've I've you know talked about her before as being a bit of an inspiration for me. And so, you know, I thought, oh yes, let's give it a go. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, it was really quick after that. They just came back very quickly and said, "You're in the show." And so there was not a, a lot no of further addition. Um, there was there was a couple of different you know um, checkpoints of, of like Zoom calls and auditions okay, and things yeah. like that, but yeah, it happened super fast, and all of a sudden they're asking us for our set design, and yeah, so it was it was super exciting, super quick, which was good. So I didn't have too much time to think about it and think about the reality of what I was about to do. Cool. I mean, I'm sure people like me are interested in the actual process, you know, with Shark Tank. So audition tape couple of Zoom calls, you're in the show, send us your set design and then what you're, you're turning up in front of the sharks, you, you have to, do you have to prepare a pitch, do you have to present that somewhere beforehand or is it just, you just have to turn up and do your best? Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was just at, like, I think a week's notice of you're wow. flying to Sydney and you're going to pitch. Um, 
<clears throat> and they fly Sorry. down business class, right? Of course, you know, all expenses paid <laughs> in the Hilton. It was Qantas, but that, <laughs> I mean, that was about the most business class of it. Um, look, I was so sick. It's crazy. I had the worst tonsillitis. So the whole trip is a little bit of a blur. <laughs> but yeah, you have to prepare a two to three minute pitch. Um, and and then they'll ask questions. And, and if you've entered the business awards process before, either the Sunshine Coast ones or, or a different one, it's, you know, it's quite a similar process usually that you go in and you pitch and then you answer the questions. And so I think going through that business awards process is what probably got me the most prepared for mm, it yeah. um, because I've done that for three years now and just, you know, it, it's really hard to do a pitch when you're first doing it. I used to run the business awards and tell, make other businesses go in it and tell them to do it. And now when you're on the other side of it, you're like, oh, wow, this is really hard to actually tell your story in a really st- succinct way that doesn't ramble and gets to the point. Um, and so, and, and you've got to remember it. Mm. <laughs> so that was the hardest thing, just trying to remember those two to three minutes. Yeah, and not coming in with a, a page of notes. No, <laughs> I knew if I went in and stuffed that up, that would be what they air and show. So I was, I knew I just had to remember that part. And and being so sick, I just, I was really struggling with that, even on the morning of. Um, but I got in there and I did it and I did it perfectly to how I'd practised it, um, which was a big relief. And then honestly, after that, I, I actually really relaxed. Um the most terrifying part was walking in. So, you know, you're in this pre-room doing some recordings and um, I could just feel my heartbeat just going insane. And then they tell you to that they're going to play that Shark Tank music and you walk in and stand on the circle and they'll play it for a couple of minutes and you just got to listen to the end of the music, then you start. And it, it, still today when I hear that music my heart just starts pumping because that was terrifying walking in and seeing all these shiny sharks and, and just staring at them for a couple of minutes going oh my god is the music ever going to stop that's a long time to it, be standing there yeah so as I was watching the the series air every time I heard that music it just gave me the worst anxiety so um but yeah once I did the pitch and then um after that I just felt really relaxed because that's when they start and, and they were firing questions like faster than I've ever heard questions. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I think when you get to the question parts, like, you know, your business and, you know, I know my numbers, I know all of those things. And so when they were firing all those questions, I felt in my comfort zone that I could just answer all of that. It's hard when they're shouting them over each other, but, um, you know, that, that was where I felt, you know, the most relaxed mm. <laughs> in a lot of ways. I forgot the cameras were there. Yeah. So you applied to Shark Tank on a bit of a whim, as you said, you know, as a bit of a last minute, oh, let's give it a crack. I like the show. Um, but did you go, at, at what stage did you develop some goals or did you have any goals for what did you want to achieve from this? Or did you just go, just having fun, seeing what happens? Look, I think um, the the objective, the main objective was really about exposure for the right. business, you know, getting the business on TV and um, and and having the effect of the as seen on Shark Tank logo is is amazing, um, and and so it was really that was the main goal is just to get that kind of exposure. We love doing any media opportunities. Like if you're in business and you're not taking advantage of those opportunities, then why are you in business? You're not there to hide away you're there to tell people about what you do so that they use your services or your products or whatever it is so um so we do anything that that's going to bring you know a good exposure to the business I didn't really think through the fact that if I totally stuffed it up it might have brought bad exposure to the business but luckily I didn't totally stuff it up or I don't think I did so um you know that so it, it, it for us it was really about the exposure I mean in terms of the investment side of things I've certainly been thinking about that path for a long time time it's quite a terrifying path because you know it's the fear of the unknown and um you know you were based at the innovation center I've spent a lot of time at the innovation center there's a lot of education and workshops and training around getting ready for investment and and um, all of those sorts of things but I don't feel like I had done a lot of that and I you know as a female founder as well people were not as interested in you you know we had a laundry service we kind of needed a lot of revenue before people would even Mm. you know start to see us as a serious business and so the investment path was something I was quite nervous about but um, I mean obviously the outcome is amazing um, and wasn't really you know what I was expecting or going in there with the goal of but um, still you know super exciting um, you know to to go in there and and get that kind of offer. 
Yeah. So for those that haven't seen the show, I mean, go and watch the show, but you did get that $1 million investment from one of the sharks. Um, you know, it was big news uh, in Australian media that, you know, that, that I think it was the, the largest single inv investment amount in Shark Tank's history, Shark Tank Australia anyway. Yes. Um, what, what did that mean to you? Like, you know, when you, did you realise at the time that that was such a, such a big thing or, you know, did you just, like, just mind blown? Like I, was... um, my mind is still blown. I didn't realise at the time, I didn't realise until the show aired that it was the biggest ever um, investment in Shark Tank Australia history. Um, and, you know, I think I was so focused on just delivering the pitch and the questions that I hadn't really thought through, you know, how like what that would actually feel like if, if that did happen. Um, it, it, um, yeah, I'm still like, I was so shell shocked straight after. I remember them asking me all these questions and I was like, ah, what? Um, I, I, you know, the most magical thing I think for me was the fact that Robert Hajavik, who is a shark who, who um, gave us the offer, he is a really well-known um, international businessman. He's from, he's, Canada. He's got a massive cybersecurity business. He's a shark on Shark Tank US and on the Dragon's Den in Canada. And so for someone who sees businesses all the time and um, for him to look at, you know, that mm. pitch and go, I'm valuing your business at three and a half million dollars and here's a million dollars to invest in it. Like that was, you know, I still get goosebumps thinking about just the fact that he thought he could see that, you know, that was the value of this this little business that I started as a single mum with no money and, you know, and have built like piece by piece, <laughs> having no investment, you know, we couldn't even get a credit card until recently for the business. Like, you know, it's just all of those things. And I think, oh my goodness, how did, how did this all happen? <laughs> yeah. It's incredible validation for what you've built and, and the vision for where you're, you're going to take this business as well. And I know you, you didn't go in there asking for a million dollars for, for Shark Tank. For those that don't know the format of the show, you need to go in with an ask, right? You need to have, I believe they, they insist that you have some sort of an ask, don't Yes, they? absolutely, yeah. yes. So you've got to have um, the amount that you're asking for, for the for equity. The equity amount. Yeah, and that was really tough as well, just working out, you know, how to value your business. Um, for some businesses, it's probably an easier task. Um, we're not a product-based business, we're a service-based business. So it's really hard for us to, to value that. Um, and, and everyone values it differently is what I've A lot I've of people mess that up too yeah. on Shark Tank. Oh, like that's the thing they hammer you on the most. And I was terrified of that. But, um, and, and so, yeah, we went in asking for a $750,000 investment and he said, you need more money. <laughs> so that was kind of insane as well, because I hadn't really you know, I, I thought it would be less money rather than mm. more money. So that, that was crazy as well. Um, yeah. Did you have too much time to consider the offer before you had to say yes? No, like about a millisecond. <laughs> In some of the other series, they get you to go face the wall and think about it. And I was waiting for them to tell me to go walk outside or, but no, they're just staring at me waiting for the answer. So yeah, that yeah. was pretty crazy. <laughs> Incredible. And, you know, I know the reality of the show and the situation is you, you make a effectively a handshake deal on the show and you know then there is a whole bunch of actual business process that happens behind that investment and I know you can't go into a lot of the detail of that but you know it, so just to explain for the viewers here it, someone saying a million dollars on the show and you know for this equity of your business that's not deal done is it well I mean look the investors are still going to go through due diligence like they're not gonna you know just just hand that money straight into your bank account the minute you walk out the door um so you you know and that's a really long process due diligence and it looks different for every type of investor um is from what I can gather in terms of talking to friends who have been down this path um so yeah so we're very much in the due diligence stage um and yeah it's it's just exciting to be, you know, talking to Robert and his team and, um, and, and thinking about the future and, you know, what, what that kind of investment could bring us. Um, you know, we definitely have uh, plans to, to scale and grow continually, but um, also to go into new markets. So we just launched into New Zealand this year and, um, you know, once we sort of get that better down, then I think we'll be starting to look into new markets like Canada or the US and, and yeah, thinking about where else we could, we can take our services. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, what is the future? Like, what, I, 
and I'm sure that changes, right? That that goalpost or that vision of a, of a business changes from foundation, you know, all through the years, probably constantly. But where do you see this vision now? Like you're talking about expanding into international markets. Where's the laundry lady going? Is it is it a global empire? Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, look, I think we definitely just want to keep growing and keep expanding. I, I feel really passionate about what our business opportunity brings to people, you know. Our, our, all of our contractors, our laundry ladies and lads have a have an awesome story about why they joined us and how they were looking for flexibility and what that means to them. And so, you know, I want to continue that journey and continue helping them in business and, and, and lots more. Um, so, you know, definitely growth is is our big um, big goal. At the moment, we're, we're launching this new digital system, which is a really big task. Um, and, and I feel like I've been saying for two years, or oh, we just need this digital system that'll fix that problem that'll fix that problem so once we get that better down I think that's going to give us a really solid base operationally to be able to grow and you know do a lot of the things that we've we've wanted to do around around that growth pattern so yeah yeah in business there's a there's a saying around the idea of new level new devil and I think that's <laughs> yes. probably pretty true for you absolutely absolutely it's like you know I, I think back to two years ago when I couldn't get a credit card and and how difficult that was and now the banks are coming after us saying do you want more money or do you want this and you know and that's it's like why couldn't you give me that two years ago when I really really needed it but now there's a whole lot of other challenges that you know just you've got to get through every day and I think you just have to take things one step at a time when there's a lot of it and and get through and get to the next bit and then deal with those new challenges when they come. Yeah. So where does the Sunshine Coast fit in this future journey? Like you're based, your head office is here. Is that, are you going to keep it here? Like, Yeah, I mean, I have no plans to move away from here. My kids are at school here, so I'll be here for at least the next kind of 10 years. But um, where our, our warehouse space is here, where we have our um, supplies that we sell to our contractors, our laundry liquids and bags and things like that. Um, the Australia operations will obviously stay here. If we go for New Zealand, we're supporting supporting that from Australia. Um, if we go into other markets like Canada and the US, we'll likely, you know, set up offices in those spaces. I wouldn't mind going living in the US for a little bit, go and help set it up. And we'll see what happens in the next yeah. few years. But yeah, this is definitely our home. And, and you know, and, and what I think has been amazing for me coming to the Sunshine Coast as I came here as this, you know, newly single mum, you have to rebuild my life and with a business that I'd like, had no time for um, as a side hustle and you know I networked a lot here and I found a very you know supportive business community and I think you're probably one of the first people I met out at the innovation center and um, you, you know having that network in place is what helps you get through all those tough times in business as you're growing and getting to the next challenge and all of, you know because there's always someone to talk to who might have gone through you know something like that as well and so yeah I can't see any better place to have as our business home than the Sunshine Coast. Absolutely. So for just in closing here, Susan, for anyone who's listening or watching this show and whether their view is to build a global laundry empire, well, not a laundry empire, that would be in competition, right? <laughs> a global business uh, from a Sunshine Coast base or, or whatever that is, To speaking to that kind of, maybe it's that, that stay-at-home mum thinking, what am I doing? You know, what's my vision? Where am I going? And I've got an idea. What would you say to them to to inspire them to to keep moving or, or get yeah, to the next look, step? I think knowing what your vision is in mm. the beginning, like understanding your why and why you're doing it is really important, you know, and, and you don't like you might not be able to flesh that out in huge detail in the beginning, but. It hasn't really changed for me from when I started The Laundry Lady to, to what it is now. You know, it was really about having that flexibility to spend with my kids and, um, and and the whole business has been built on that. That's our vision. Our values are around that and staying true to that is, is what has kept us successful, I think. You know, there's been advisors that I've talked to along the way who've said, oh, why don't you do the model like this, Which is, you know, in a completely different way. And I'm like, well that takes us completely away from what our vision and values are. And if you don't believe in that vision and values, you can't stay on track with that and promote that. So I think no matter what size of business you are, whether you're just a one one person business or you've got a big team, then you've really got to know what those values are and, and stay stay on track to that through throughout your journey. 
Well, thank you for that, Susan. We call you Susan as seen on Shark Tank <laughs> Toft from The Laundry Lady. This has been, it, it's really an inspiring story. You know, I think, you know, whether, and I know it is just the beginning of your story as well. And so definitely I'll be continuing to follow your story. And I know that many people on the Sunshine Coast are just so proud that, you know, we have a business you know, that is, is doing amazing things like you are on the Thank Sunshine you. Coast here. And I know through all of your previous, um, you know, roles that you've had in business as well, like you, you've built a great network here on the Sunshine Coast. And um, so thank you for sharing your story. I think it's been, it's been really valuable. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. And for you guys watching here and listening, whether you're listening on the podcast, hit that subscribe button on your podcast player of choice or subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss another episode of the Coast and Commerce podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.